The title of my talk is The Vagina Dialogues, The Things That We Thought That We Knew. And what I'd like to do is to begin to introduce you to something that you might find quite surprising. And that is the human body is an ecosystem. We actually share our space with 100, 100 trillion microorganisms. Bacterial cells and fungal cells and yeast cells that are too small to see with the naked eye, but they reside in and on the human body, wherever you might even be able to imagine. They're important to our nutrition, they're important to modulating our immune system, and they defend us against pathogens. There are more than 10,000 different species of microorganisms that are on your bodies as we sit here in this room. That may come as quite a surprise to you. They outnumber your cells by 10 to 1. There's more microorganisms on your body than there are cells of you. Who would have thought? They also constitute 1 to 3 percent of your body weight. So they're not insignificant even in that standpoint. These facts could well surprise you, especially if you're using, usually used to thinking of germs as things that should be eradicated and avoided at all costs, because these organisms are actually essential to us. Collectively, these organisms are called the human microbiome. It's the biome that includes the host as well as all the organisms that are present. And the research to understand who they are, what they do, and how they contribute to our health has become a very important and active area of research in recent years. The distribution of bacteria on your body varies so that the organisms that are in your mouth, in your nose, in your gut, on your skin differ. So they're different assemblages of species that exist across your body and they're very heterogeneous. The ones that we study quite a bit that I'd like to spend my time today talking about is the human vagina. So the human vagina is obviously very important to women's health. And there are some facts that people are usually quite amazed to hear. One is that it's very densely populated. There's about 100 million bacteria in one milliliter of vaginal secretions. So it's very, very densely populated. And there are hundreds of species that reside in the human vagina of women of all ages. And I think that most of the people think that the vagina would be sterile. Perhaps they might think that it has lactic acid bacteria present. But few actually realize just what a diverse ecosystem this actually is. What's remarkable is that most women are healthy most of the time. On the planet today, there are 3.5 billion women, and the experiment has been done repeatedly over time, and most women end up being quite healthy. That's remarkable. It's remarkable in part because of the disturbances and the changes and the pressures that are actually exerted on the vaginal microbial communities in the vagina. One example in reproductive age women would be menses where there's a dramatic change in the nutrients that are available to the bacteria, a dramatic change in the environmental conditions, and yet the system rebounds. It's very resistant to change, and yet it's very resilient in its ability to come back to the state where it was, where it is so important to protecting women against infectious diseases of all sorts. There are times when it's out of balance. When this ecosystem is out of balance, there's an increased risk that women experience to any kind of infectious disease. And that would include sexually transmitted infections of all sorts, including chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, and even the HIV virus. In pregnant women, when the system is out of balance, there can be an increased risk to preterm delivery, low birth weight infants, and pelvic inflammatory disease. So understanding what factors determine the balance in this ecosystem and how the system responds to different kinds of perturbations becomes fairly important to making sure that women are healthy. When the system is out of balance, it's often accompanied by symptoms, and those symptoms include a thin discharge and vaginal odor. So women that don't often talk about it experience vaginal odor, and, it, and it's something that affects their self-esteem, that they can be embarrassed by, and they don't know what to do about it, and yet this kinds of symptoms are associated with a phenomenon called bacterial vaginosis. When you look across women and do a cross-section, 20% of women experience bacterial vaginosis at any given time. So it's a very common thing for this system to go out of whack for a period of time. So we're interested in understanding what are the drivers of these systems, what makes them balanced, what works to maintain women's health, and what we can do to understand this. Well, obviously this is a, something that's been 
research for a number of years, more than 100 years. And what people have come to understand and what's commonly known uh, in the media and among healthcare practitioners is that a healthy vagina has high numbers of lactobacillus. Now, lactobacillus is an organism that you may not have ever heard of, but you've actually experienced in different ways because it's used for the production of yogurt, for example. It's used for the production of a wide range of fermented foods. And the way that it works in those cases, like for a fermented food, is that the organism actually consumes substrate and produces lactic acid, which lowers the pH and makes it so that other organisms are less likely to be happy in an acidic environment. So it works for the preservation of food. And basically, the thought is that that's pretty much how it works in the vagina, that there are lactobacillus species in the vagina, they produce lactic acid, they reduce the environmental pH, and that's how they protect women. So it could be really quite simple. The common wisdom is that it is quite simple, that these communities are dominated by species of lactobacillus, they produce an acidic environment where the pH is less than 4.5, and that's healthy. This idea of 4.5 as the magical pH ends up to be very, very instrumental in how people think about health versus disease. So if you have a vaginal pH of greater than 4.5, you'll be told maybe you should see your health care provider because this is not a healthy situation. So it's deeply ingrained in people's thinking. What this has led to is the notion that all women are pretty much the same, that they have pretty much the same bacteria in the vagina, and that they all have vagina, uh, vaginal communities that are relatively stable over time. They're pretty much identical. There are no differences among women of different ages, uh, or different ethnicities, or in different communities or at different times. So this really conjures up the notion of Plato's theory of, of form, which is to say that there's an ideal form that everything gets compared to, right? That the, that the world is composed of archetypical types, and you can determine whether or not it's, it's a healthy person by comparing it to some concept of what is normal and healthy. And I just explained to you what was thought to be normal and healthy. A lactobacillus-dominated community and a low acidic pH. Here's the rub. Mark Twain said it best. He said, it isn't what we don't know that gives us trouble. It's what we know that just ain't so. So there's a few inconvenient truths about the vaginal ecosystem, which I'd like to share with you, based upon research that I have done in con collaboration with a number of people uh, at other institutions. One of them is that we did a study that involved 400 women that were drawn from four different ethnic groups, black, white, Asian, and Hispanic women. And so in doing that, we asked them to collect a sample and to send it to us. And then when we looked to see what kinds of bacteria were present in those samples, we found out that there were actually five kinds of communities that were present in these women, five. Four of them were dominated by lactobacillus, as the common wisdom suggests. They each had a different species, which was the predominant type in those communities, and that's how we could tell them apart. What was a little bit surprising was the fact that 27% of women had communities that were not dominated by lactobacillus. 27%. So a quarter of women don't comply with that the notion of uh, co the common wisdom. When we looked to see how those community types were distributed among women from different ethnic groups, we found that the, the women in those ethnic groups all had the same five communities, but they differed in the proportions. So some kinds of communities were more common in, say, white women, this gold sector right here, as compared to Hispanic women, Asian women, and black women. Conversely, this darker brown was more common in Hispanic women, but actually kind of uncommon in white women, and so forth. And so if you look at this, yes, they all had the same fi five kinds of communities, but the ethnicity affected uh, the kinds of communities that were most commonly found. This was really quite unheard of. It was not known that there were such profound differences between uh, these communities. And it's notable that this dark brown is the kind of community where the lactobacillus species are not dominant. So those unusual, if you want to say that, unusual types were more common in Hispanic and black women than they were in Asian women or white women. 
And then we actually had a sample taken where we could measure the vaginal pH. And so we measured the pH of all these 400 women. And what we found is that the median pH for white women was 4.4 as it was for Asian women. But Hispanic and black women were significantly higher. Now the median is when 50% are higher and 50% are lower. So this means that most Hispanic women and most black women do not have a healthy vaginal pH according to common wisdom. And yet these women were asymptomatic, they were healthy, there was no reason to think that anything was amiss. And so the common wisdom starts to get questioned, right, about whether or not what we thought we knew was actually true or not. The next thing that we've done is to look at a number of women over time. Because these were, in the previous things that I've just shown you, they're snapshots in time. Here's what they were on this day. And what we wanted to know was whether or not they changed over time. And so we asked women to collect samples on a daily basis for 10 weeks. And we have 135 women in this study. And so we get a very fine scale resolution to get an idea of how these things change over time. What we found, which is quite surprising to us, was that they do change over time. In fact, sometimes they change dramatically over time. In fact, sometimes they change over a very short time period. Where the community can change in terms of its composition within 24 to 48 hours, and then it'll go back to some other composition, perhaps what it was before that abrupt change, perhaps not. Some women are relatively stable over time and really don't change no matter what's going on. The striking thing is when we take all of these data and we spread them out and we look at all the different patterns that we see among all the different women, there are no two that are alike. They're highly personalized. That each woman has her own community and her own community dynamics. And what is changing, what's leading to those changes, is not understood. But they're healthy and they're normal. So what we've done here is to try to say, well, this, uh, this notion of healthy and normal really started to bother me because that's what people like to do. They like to say, well, you're healthy and you're normal and so we're all good to go. And so there's a lot of debate about what healthy and normal is. And so I would look for a source of information on what's healthy and normal and I went to the World Health Organization website and I looked to see what was the definition of health. And what they said was that health was a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So I think that that means that most of us in the room are not healthy. So now that we've gotten past that, now we're going to think about, well, how much are we on towards the end road of total decay versus some kind of normal kind of uh, healthy state that we're in? So how do we redefine normal and healthy? Who's healthy? Who's normal? And who gets to decide? In our present situation, it actually turns out to be a lot of the healthcare providers. And I think that the way that they treat women's health really denies autonomy to the woman, and it smacks of paternalism, where some expert is going to tell you whether or not you're okay or not, and then label you with someone in some way that you're either abnormal, you're unusual, you're peculiar, you're odd, you're strange. There's all kinds of words that can be used if, they don't, if you don't conform to the model that's in someone's head. And what I told you in, earlier in the talk is, is that normal is simply lactobacillus and a low pH. And if you don't conform with that, then you must not be very normal. So we need to reevaluate healthy and normal. And in doing so, we have to account for differences in ethnic groups and differences between individuals. Unfortunately, good information that's based on science is very hard to find in the popular media. If you go to the web and you start looking at what is actually published, you might get advice that you should, that you should steam clean your vagina. Up here you can put sugar in your vagina. There's a lawmaker that actually thinks the vagina is connected to the stomach and so if you put a little camera down there you can see everything. Uh, you can modify and douche anywhere. There's all kinds of information out there and unfortunately it's not rooted in science and yet this is what women have to deal with. What we need to do is to begin a conversation. We need to begin a conversation where women share their experiences, 
where the idea of talking about the V word is no longer such a, such a taboo in societal circles, that we can get information and dispel the myths that are out there and the misinformation that people are trying to deal with. We especially need to get rid of the idea that women somehow have to conform as individuals to some kind of a preconceived notion of what is healthy and what is normal and what is good and celebrate the individual. So I would ask that the conversation begin today. Thank you very much.